Hi, Tim Smith of The Smith Group here at Cine Newport presenting our podcast room where we're here to highlight and expose the amazing people, properties, places, and stories of Southern California to the world. Today, I'm so thrilled to have my therapist as a guest, John Jolliffe. Can't wait to really chop it up with him. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Tim, for having me. So a little bit of a start. I'm impressed with your studio, by the way. Oh, thank you. Very cool. We try to, we have a standard we try to meet. All red cameras, you know, so. <laughs> so I, I don't know if I want to dive as much into history, but I do want to get just a little background on you. Okay. And I think the things that I would really be interested in, number one, kind of your history mm. uh, in therapy and some of the things you've done mm-hmm. and why you want to do it. <laughs> why I want to do it. Yeah. I'd probably just start there. But, uh, you know, you probably will never see initials after my name. Even though you have them. Be, you know, I have plenty of them. But the, the, that's my education. But it wasn't my training. My training came from life. By confronting life, dealing with life, overcoming life, you know, those are your real credential. I think anybody. That's what makes you, you, and makes me, me. So I've had a number of things I've overcome, and I don't know if you want to get into those details, but uh, it was just, that's where your experience and training comes. That's where the depth comes from. So when you were a kid, did you actually think, hey, I want, this is what I want to do. I want to face my own or tell me how that unraveled well i was confronted very early in life because i was orphaned as a child and uh had to make everything up you know not having a real family i didn't watch my father and then and then imitate him or you know those kind of things so i had to kind of make things up i'd watch people oh give us a little bit more so when you were orphaned mom and dad tell us how that happened so my it's a very, it's a beautiful story, interestingly enough. Uh, I don't know how far back I should go, but uh, the part that was related directly to me is that my mother uh, was kidnapped when she was three years old from her family. She, my grandmother had married into a wealthy family. So when the grandfather, my grandfather died, the family came in and kidnapped the girls so they couldn't be heirs. And so they were put in reform schools and things like that. When Pearl Harbor happened, they're all Hawaiian. I didn't know I was Hawaiian. The story that raised me is I was a child born to a woman who was 18, French, in a Paris military installation. My father was a major in the Air Force and died in combat. That's the story that raised me. That was a story that you were told. That was the story I was told. And it's not uncommon for adoptive parents to want to cloud the reality so you can't find your roots. Well, I found my roots, and my grandmother's 100% Hawaiian. And Anyway, uh, I just got back from Hawaii. We had a 150 uh, family reunion in Hawaii from all the islands. And my, my uh, aunt, Mapuana, she had just passed, so we had a big luau. So uh, anyway, so my mother was kidnapped when she was three years old. And she was put in a reform school in Hawaii. Pearl Harbor happened. She came over to Hollywood to be raised by a governess. She became an actress and a model. Uh, Had a Hollywood romance with my father, who was a major actor in the golden era of Hollywood. And uh, they got pregnant and had me. But my father, when he found out she was pregnant, abandoned her and abandoned me. My mother, not having any family, kept me for three months and sent me to an orphanage afterwards, in which I was taken out three or four times, different name changes and things like that. Do you have do you have recollection of that? I have a recollection at three months of age, when she was she took me to the orphanage, and I never knew that was what it was. But probably four or five times a year, I would have this dream, this repetitive dream. I'm in a dark room with a woman being held, rocked, and wet. And so when I did a birth search, back when I was about 32 years old, uh, I asked, I said, was I ever breastfed? Did I ever have a contact with my mother? And they said, the only evidence is 
your mother brought you in at three months of age, and they were you were and your mother were left in a room for over several hours, and she never returned. So what is my mother doing in that room? Crying. She is holding me, rocking me, and crying because she's going to leave me, the only blood and flesh she's ever seen in her life because she was taken from her mother at three years old. And she's giving me to an uncertain future, and she's crying. She's grieving. Now, I don't know if it was exactly that way, Yeah. but I didn't have the dream since 1982 ever again. When you figured it out. When I understood that. But I was three months of age when I was in that room with her. Yeah. And what that tells you is that So it wasn't a dream, it was a memory. That's right. It was a memory. Yeah. And it occurred to me when I get sad or when I got depressed, I would have this memory. Wow. Of grief. Yeah. My mother's grief. So it taught me two things. you got to listen to dreams. They may be invitations. And the second thing is you can inherit emotions. I couldn't be grieving at three months of age, but my mother was. And I inherited that. So when I got sad throughout my life, I would remember her grief, thinking it was my grief, and I would have this dream. So what happened when you were 32 and you figured it out that it, like just the actual becoming aware of it, dissipated it? Well, the number one need in mankind, in my opinion, I've traveled extensively, is one of the other trainings I had. Uh, I lived abroad and lived in villages and worked with shaman and witch doctors and all kinds of things working for travel uh, bureaus. One, one of the things that occurred to me is that uh, you're influenced by a lot of sources. And you, you get influenced by things that happen to you. Uh, and a lot of my travels help me understand my life, help me understand life in general. And that sometimes when you're so confident that you've got it figured out, you really don't. There was one story I'll tell you very quickly. So I'm sitting in the, a hut and I'm telling people, look, I played football, Vietnam. I'm a big strapping young guy and I want to help. So I want to cut wood, I want to hunt, I want to do something. Just put me to work. You're in a village. What village are you in? I'm in West Syrian Jaya, up in, in New Guinea. Okay. We're studying cannibals, okay? So I'm saying, put me to work. I'm waiting for the cameraman to take their pictures. I'm just bored to death. And so one day the chief comes by with my native speaker, and he asked me to come out, and he says, point to the future. Point to the future. So I pointed this way. He said, point to the past. I pointed that way. And he mumbled in his native language. He walked off, and I never saw him again. And I was never asked to help. So my native speaker came by so a couple of days later. So you're basically shunned because you got the answer wrong. <laughs> so my native speaker comes by a couple of days later, and I said, you know, I felt like I was put through a test, and I didn't pass. Yeah. And he said, yeah, you didn't pass, and you were tested. I said, what's so complicated with that being the future and that being the past? He says, we can see our past through music, art, dance. So our past is right in front of us. We can't see our future, so it's that way. And the chief thought, if you don't know your directions, how could you be helpful? Wow. And what that taught me was, if you're highly confident about something, be careful. Yeah. And so that became the start of my disruption. So when people say, well, glass is half full, glass is half empty, I'm always looking for the third alternative, yeah, the disruptive alternative. There yeah. may be another way of looking at this. And so that was a lot of the training that went into not the education, the formal education, but the training. So when I'm now in formal education with this training, because I had the training before the formal education, the grad school, I'm in there being disruptive. Yeah. People are saying, well, this is what depression is. And I'm going, ah, I'm not so sure. Yeah. Alcoholism. Sure. Alcoholism is a real big problem. I said, no, it's not a problem. It's a solution to a problem that creates more problems than it solves. Right. And it was so, so focused on sobriety. You talk to somebody who's been in alcoholism. Yeah, I've been sober for five years, 35 years. I go, great. 
What was the problem? Well, I was not managing alcohol. I, was, uh, I wasn't sober. No, 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 no. What was the problem for which alcohol was the solution? Right. And nobody really focuses on that. So you're really focusing on the symptom, not the problem. Exactly. Because one of the things we've or talked Or the about, solution. One of the things we've talked about with drug and alcohol, it's not you're taking these things not to... Or, or I mean, you're drinking or doing drugs to feel better, but really it's not feel better. It's to feel different That's than your exactly. natural state. And if you're doing it all the time, you would prefer to be in that state than your natural state. And the state. question is, what's wrong with this the way things are that you have to rush off to feel different? Escape or medicate. Escape. And everybody has a different escape mechanism. Totally. Escape capsule. Yeah. Could be gambling, could be sex, could be shopping, could be sports, it could be anything. But anyway, overcoming some of these things and being challenged and having this, these experiences in life. Now, mine are, mine are mine, and you've got yours, and everybody has them. And sometimes we call them trauma. But it's not trauma that shapes your life. It's what you make of trauma, how you interpret the inconveniences and trauma and things that happen to you. And how you react or respond, respond being the better option. So, uh, in 19, up until 1970 in America, very few people know this truth. I did a birth search, so I know. Up until 1970 in America, there was such a thing as illegitimate children. And illegitimate children become illegitimate adults or illegitimate human beings, right? Child's a human right. being. So there was such a thing in the law in the U.S. that you could be an illegitimate human being up until when they changed it in 1970. 1985 in the UK, 2015 in France. Illegitimate human being. Illegitimate human beings cannot inherit. They can't be baptized in church. There's a number of things that can't happen. So, I was teased that I was unwanted and I was illegitimate. Right. I put together somehow that my biological parents, my, father, my biological father was married to another woman getting an 18-year-old girl pregnant and then abandoning her and the child. Now, if there's anything that's illegitimate, it's that relationship. It's their relationship. Not, it's not the, the child. child. Yeah. What did I do wrong? But they want to... Pre pre and do you think I got that right? I was legitimate. Their relationship was illegitimate. You think I got that right? Not at first. No, but now? Yeah. Yeah. Do you know who I see in my office every day? Who? People who've got their story wrong. Well, so let's go to my story because when I came to you and we've done a lot of work, I'm the youngest of five. Okay. Grew up in a Mormon household. Mm -hmm. um, after the third, uh, my dad, my mom had an IUD, which is 99% mm -hmm. accurate that you're not getting pregnant. Had my brother, which was a bit of a shit show for my dad. All right. And then the IUD was done again before me and then I came. And I know now through digging, because there's been this inherent question I've been asking myself, am I wanted, mm -hmm. right? Oh, yeah. And we've done a lot of work on it. And I don't know in the womb or after, I just had this sense that I wasn't. So I've gone out in my life as a strategy to prove that I was wanted by asking the question, am I wanted, to everybody around me. And let me tell you, that brings problems. And there's many ways you can do it. Totally. And so with your question, am I legitimate? If you're illegitimate, you're asking yourself the wrong question. You're asking people to validate that you're legitimate when it was your parents' relationship that wasn't legitimate. That's exactly right. If I had come with the conclusion that I was, I was illegitimate or uh, yeah, not important, I would be trying to legitimize myself in everything I did. Watches, rings, money, planes, boats, everything, bragging, all that stuff to legitimize myself in every conversation. But that's a tough process to go from, I mean, hasn't there been temptations and challenges where you have tried 
to show that you were legitimate before you found out that it wasn't actually you, it was your parents' relationship that was? Yes. Well, you have to catch yourself. That's the whole training in consciousness, is catch yourself rather than be caught by somebody else. Okay, stop for a second, because that is a big, big hook. Catch yourself so somebody else isn't catching you. That's right. And, 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 and because of the community and the culture we live in, bragging and, and talking about what you have and all these things and envy and all that, it's a big issue. It happens to all of us. So the idea is when you start down that conversational road, catch yourself before you get caught. You get caught or embarrass yourself with all this. Do you know who I am and where I've been? And all that stuff. Right. Yeah. Dealing with that trauma. Right, the trauma which creates behaviors that aren't in your best interest. So what happens is that things happen to all of us. You have a story, I have a story, we all have stories. We don't have enough life experience or wisdom to know how to properly conclude our own stories, but conclude we do anyway. And those conclusions are really false conclusions. Right. I'm not worthy, I'm not good enough, all these things. I'm illegitimate. I'm not wanted. Well, to, to speak of that, so you remember when we had my dad in your office yeah. years ago, until I sat and listened because I actually told him the story. I felt unwanted. Like that was a real thing that I felt, like to my core, right? And there was a million things that I used as evidence to support my story, right or wrong. But when I heard him explaining, you know, he had three kids. He was stressed financially. His mom and dad had passed. He didn't feel up to the task. Not that he didn't want me or want my brother. He just didn't feel up to the task. And he was explaining. And as he was explaining, as much understanding as I got kind of changed my perspective on that thing. And you remember at the end, I think this kind of, and it was maybe a little unfair to my dad because I brought him in there to work through some of my conclusions and right. change them. Right. But I remember at the end, you know, I, we got up and you gave me a hug, <laughs> which in reality, I just wanted a hug from him. And after we talked about it and then we hugged and we embraced for a long time and shed some tears and he explained further and it really helped me to get through it. Not that I still am not tempted with that question, right? But now, as I ask the question, as I think about it, it's like, okay, even though I have these feelings, which I can't trust, what I really need to understand is, am I wanted? Do I want me? And is that the, that's the question, which I am, I am. And, and I would probably debate, and I would say those probably aren't feelings, those are probably thoughts. Right, absolutely. I am not wanted. Yes. Am I wanted? Yes. See, life is a series of questions that we have to get answered. We have to get them answered. But after you've gotten them answered, how many times do you have to repeat the question? Right. But here's the problem. If you're smart enough, and you and I are smart enough, if we're smart enough to know what the right question is, unfortunately, we're not smart enough to know who the right person to ask. When you ask the right question of the wrong person and get the right answer, yes, I adore you, I want you, I want you to be my agent, I want you to be my friend. Yeah. When you get the, ask the right question of the wrong people and you get the right answer, it doesn't help because it's the wrong person. Right. So the question is, who is the right person? So who is the right person? We oftentimes think it's ourselves, but in a lot of cases, you're question you need to ask of the person is your father. Yeah. That, and, and here's what the mistake we all make, and your father made that mistake that day. He wanted to explain. It's not his explaining that's going to do the healing. It's your telling him everything that you bottled up and your worry and your questions and all that. And if he would listen and empathize and sympathize with that, and give you a hug, that's where the healing comes in. Well, Not in his explanation. Know, but that's what happened after. And the funny thing is, is I actually felt, I don't know if it was an emotional, a psychological, I felt like this release because I'm like, oh my gosh. Like I, you were just a young man trying to do your best without 
you know, having parents and other things, the support that you needed, like the understanding gave me a release of that whole. That's right. And the question is, did you get enough relief? Did you get enough said? Did you get enough revealed? Sometimes we stop short because we make them uncomfortable or they're uncomfortable and therefore we stop short. But we do get some relief because we got more out than we ever have before. Yeah. The question is, is there more to come? Right. I always think there is. Yeah, there's always deeper. So let me ask you a question as we're, as we're starting this. So one of the things I've found in therapy, as embarrassed as I am to say it, and I think we've been working together for 10 years, and it's been, I mean, through the group or whatever, you know, at least bi-monthly, a lot of times weekly and more often. Can I interrupt you for a minute? Sure. Okay. Embarrassment is when something is going to be revealed before you're ready. Well, so, so And so since you are revealing it, it's not embarrassment. Well, so now, but like one of the questions I want to ask is, in therapy, first of all, people go for a lot of different reasons. They've been caught or they've been forced to go. But half the time I've realized in the first few years of my therapy, I wasn't even beyond being honest with you. Yeah. I wasn't like you always ask, you ask a question that I think is, Probably one of the greatest questions you can ask anyway. I don't want you to tell me what you want me to know. Tell me the things you don't want me to know. That you're like mortified for any human you being remember that, yeah. to figure out, right? And so as a therapist, why do you want to do it? First of all, there's so few people that actually want to want therapy, yeah. number one. And second, when they go, half the time they're not even being honest with themselves or you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's, <laughs> so, so why do I want to do it? Yeah. I love puzzles. Okay. I love questions. I love the deeper things in life. It's very hard for me to go to a cocktail party. It's all about interviews. Hey, what's going on? And then boom. Where do you live? What do you do? Yeah, what, what do you, do, you do? What kind of car do I have? <laughs> <laughs> and I want to have that, you know, deeper kind of conversation. Hey, have you ever thought that the life you're living is not the life that wants to live in you? Whoa, 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 slow down. <laughs> have you ever thought the life you're living is not the life that wants it to live in you? Like that would be an interesting question for people to really digest. And we, we would have two minutes on that and somebody would come in and say, hey, you want a drink? You want to, what's going on? Have yeah. you been to the Ram game? Yeah, shot, shot. And we're like, <laughs> all right, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it's hard for me to go to cocktail parties. But your desire to continue is because people are like puzzles. They're like puzzles. And when, when people really understand that therapy is so, it's like the best massage in the world. It's, it's like the best relief in the world, like the deep sigh, you know? Uh, when they realize the real benefits of therapy, that's the remuneration, seeing it and hearing it in people's lives putting the lights together, putting their stories together. What I said about drawing conclusions before you have enough life experience and wisdom to properly conclude, but conclude we do anyway. Yeah. Those false conclusions live in our adult life as confusion. Right. People are confused about a lot of things. And the reason, the way you resolve confusion is to say, okay, now with your life experience and your wisdom, let's go back and properly conclude. And we go back and properly conclude. Are you aware that this comment you make, uh, I'm not good enough, is not a complete sentence? To boil, wa to to boil water? Yeah, yeah. To get me to Mars? I mean, right. what, what is it? Yeah, yeah. See, it's an incomplete sentence. And are you taking somebody's fall for them? Maybe they weren't competent enough. Maybe they weren't skilled enough to raise you, to discipline you, to whatever. The people who ra grow up with this idea that I'm difficult, I was a difficult child, is an inherited conclusion. Your mother or your father was saying, you're difficult for me. Right. And we took it personally and said, we're illegitimate. We're a difficult child. Yes. And what we need to do with that confusion now in our adult life, we need to go back and reconclude that. It's almost like sunlight is the ultimate disinfectant. And unless you go back there and you really look at it, at all aspects, you know, then you're not going to be able to change the story that you're telling yourself yeah. or the conclusion that you're making. That's so right. for all those people that 
won't go to therapy. Like, what do you say to them? Like, I don't want to go to therapists. Therapists are quacks, this and that. Because now being in therapy so long, sometimes I'll talk about it and people are like, you go to therapy? Like, I'm like, oh, is that a bad thing? I think that's really changing. And I think a lot more people are embracing it. They may not know which therapist because, you know, sometimes we seek out therapists who are compromised. They're not going to ask the hard questions. They're not going to be active. I mean, look how active I am. Right. Right? Yeah. Some therapists try to create a very safe place and they don't say anything. Right. One of the most important lines on my intake form is, have you ever had therapy and with who? Yeah. Okay. Because now I see, oh, it's Dr. George. Okay. Dr. George. When's the last time you saw Dr. George? Oh, a month ago, two weeks ago, a year ago. Well, why didn't you go back to Dr. George? Why are you here seeing me? Yeah. Sounds like I'm trying to give patients away. Yeah. No, I want to know. Well, I didn't go back to him because he talks too much. Well, I don't want to be that guy. Or he, he didn't say anything. He just sat there. Yeah. He didn't say anything. Well, I don't want to be that guy. So you're teaching me how to be your therapist. Right. By right. answering that question, why you didn't go back to that guy. Yeah. Or gal or whoever it is. So, so one of the things that you say quite frequently that's really, I mean, it's become a, a total different perspective for me is there are no relationship problems. There are only personal problems that become evidence, what, evident or that, that, that come about when you're in a relationship. Talk a little bit more about that. So I've been a therapist for over 40 years. I was interviewed on television recently and they said, how many consults is that? I said, I have no idea. Yeah. They sent me back during the commercial to the green room to do the math. I came up with 96,000 consults, okay? Wow. I feel like a farmer's insurance commercial. <laughs> I know a thing or two because I've heard a thing yeah, or two, yeah. okay? So in all those 96,000 consults in 40 years, I've never seen a marital problem. Never I've seen, in 96,000 consults, no marital problems. Never seen a marital problem. I've seen relationship problems, and I oftentimes, after assessing their marital relationship, will say, oh, I think we're going to have to terminate your relationship in order to save your marriage. Because it's your relationship that's creating the problem. And what do people typically do? They terminate their marriage rather than terminate their relationship and find a new way of relating. Right. It's all about relationships. And many people need individual therapy before you can really do marriage counseling. They're not ready for marriage counseling. Right. Because then it just becomes like you're a mediator. Well, he did this, she did that. Right. And you're like, okay, I don't really want to hear the story. It's the dynamic that's important. Like what creates this, right? It's always the dynamic. You can chase stories. Today we burned the popcorn. Tomorrow we kicked the dog. The third day we cheated on our spouse. All different stories, but they're linked to a dynamic that may be very common. Yeah. Well, so that leads me to another question, because I think about this, like, is there a perfect fit? Is there a twin flame? Is there, your, you know, their side? Because you, like, everybody has this idea, and I think marriage, maybe the institution of marriage has become obsolete to some extent because we have the wrong KPIs or metrics, like what, like what constitutes a great marriage? Peace, happiness, whatever. But in reality, it seems like the institution of marriage is the perfect environment for people to deal with their personal issues within a relationship, otherwise they wouldn't. If you don't have a committed relationship, and that's what marriage really entails, a committed relationship, painful and complicated to get out of, Yes. Cost you more to get out of a marriage than get in. Okay. Right? Yeah. If We're you staying. don't yeah. yeah. If you don't have that kind of committed relationship, the work of developing yourself, the work of maturing yourself wouldn't take place. If they were all girlfriends and boyfriends, we would just depart. Right. When things got rough. Right. Well, all of a sudden you have an estate, you have children, you have a commitment, all these things. You're gonna stay. Some people don't stay to work it out. They just stay because they can't afford to leave or they're, you know, whatever. But uh, without the institution, I don't think we would grow as people. But let's take a look. Now, 
If you look at housing, since you're in the housing market, if you look at houses, when you're in your 20s and you buy your first house, it's probably what you can afford, and it's probably got two bedrooms at the most. Right. One bathroom, two bedrooms, boom. Now, you can't stay in that house for the duration of your lifetime. Right. Because all of a sudden, you've got more people. Yeah. You have children. you got a dog. you got two dogs. Whatever's happening. Yeah. you got toys. you got all kinds Life of Life events. Change. So what you do is you terminate your residency and you move. Correct. What marriage is, is you don't terminate the marriage and, and, and flip marriages like we flip houses. So what we have to do with our marriage, kind of like we do with our houses, we add another room. Right. So you've got to add another skill. I've been married now 52 years. Yeah. If you want to stay in a relationship, you've got to develop new understandings, new perspectives, new life. When two become one, that doesn't mean I become you. Right. You see? And the idea that marriage is my best friend and my sex partner and my confidant and my golf buddy and all this. Marriages are never designed to be the end all and be all. You've got to have friends. You've got to have life apart from each other. And that's right. what makes life work. Right. But you've got to add skills. You can't, with the skill set you start at 20 years old, your life has become so much more complicated. Your marriage is so much more complicated. You've got to add skills. And if you think of therapy or counselors, coaches, they're teachers. They, they're skills, they do skill sets. The difference between counseling and therapy is a big difference. Right. People don't know it. They use the words interchangeably. A counselor is a teacher, and you're the student, and if you'll be quiet and let me teach you, I can show you some new things. Now, as a therapist, it's just the opposite. You're the teacher, and I'm the student, and if I can listen and ask good questions and you can get you talking about your life, then I can shift over to counseling and teach you things. So the best is both a therapist and a counselor. Only if I'm being honest. Only if you're being honest. Right. Yeah, that's interesting. Or I'll teach you things you don't need. Right. Or if I'll you're teach not you honest. just to keep it going, right? <laughs> So are you married to your soulmate or your twin flame? I would say not. I would say she's made me a better person. I trust that I've made her a better person. I think I have. Um, but I'm not so sure there are soulmates. I think there's compatible. I think some people are more compatible than others. Yeah. My wife and I have some incompatibilities. We have some very strong compatibilities. I think the strong compatibilities keep us together where the other incompatibilities, I like golf, she doesn't like golf. Right. That's not a big incompatibility. But trust, security, has my back, uh, faithful, you know, willing to do whatever we have to do to make it work. Those are strong compatibilities. So, I'm gonna give, to, I'm so gonna... this idea of soulmate is kind of like, I was going to ask you that. Her. Yeah, it's like, I mean, as much as it works in the movies, it's not. <laughs> no. And I, I'm not sure that I actually could see these are soulmates. Cause nothing, I don't even think we know what a soul is, let alone find a mate <laughs> yeah. for it. And nothing is as, as it seems. It's funny how you see all these families and couples. Like, yeah. Oh, when you're like, okay, that's uh -huh. not what it seems. Uh -huh. Okay, so going back to my question, which I was, I think that I lost it. We were talking about soulmates. We were talking about, oh, this is what I was going to ask. One of the things I've noticed through my group therapy, my own therapy, when I'm being really honest and I've really taken that on, is there's nothing that I could say that would shock you. Almost, it's almost totally opposite. Like I think, I'll, I'll give you an example. If I told you that I killed somebody, mm -hmm. what would you be your response? Did you know them? But you would be curious. Mm -hmm. And you would start asking me, and I think there's this misconception, like there's right and wrong, and there's so many things in relationships yeah. that people deem right and wrong and this and that. You almost look at things as, okay, you did this, but what was the reason? It's puzzled. Yeah, it wasn't, it's not bad, it's not good. So when I graduated in, in psychology in my grad school, I wanted the toughest internship I could get. 
Okay. So I went to federal prison for five years. And How old are you at the time? Uh, 28. Married, single? Married. Okay. One child. So you went to federal prison as an internship? For an internship. I spent 10 hours a day in and who were what was who were your clientele? And I wanted to specialize in psychopaths, okay. serial killers. Interesting. So all the famous serial killers. I'm not going to mention them because somebody might be watching. Yeah. So all the famous serial killers were friends of mine. Yeah. I spent time at three o'clock in the morning sitting closer than I am with you. Yeah. And you, if you saw Hannibal Lecter, the FBI told Jodie Foster, "Don't get." Too close to, don't get too close to the glass. You don't want Hannibal to get inside your head. So my job was to get inside their head and not let them get inside my head. Yeah. And it was very, very helpful what I learned. And one of the things I learned was the difference between a narcissist and a psychopath. A narcissist has no empathy. A narcissist has no empathy. Okay. They may have sympathy. They may have sympathy, but not empathy. And we can talk about that in a minute. But a narcissist has no empathy. A psychopath has no conscience. So and therefore, a... somebody without a conscience has a decided advantage in business over somebody who does. Because they're willing to do anything? Willing to do anything, take advantage of you at all levels. Can you actually, could you actually discern the difference when you were talking to them? Talking to the psychopath? Yeah. Could you actually, oh. dis you could discern like, okay, there's no conscience here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I wrote an article called the, the Dark Side of the Moon, in which I helped analyze psychopaths so people can pick them up. One in every 25 people in America are psychopaths. Interesting. Psychopath, sociopath, antisocial personality we call con men. Uh, only 2%, 3% wind up in prison. The others are people we're married to or partnering with and all that. They just have no conscience. Yeah. So you, you say to your guy you employed, hey, I've got a big presentation. I mean, it's a killer deal. Big presentation on Monday. I need this power presentation in the, in the portfolio. Please get it to me. Monday comes around and you go, where's the portfolio? Where's the power presentation? Oh, this Monday? I thought you meant next Monday. And you go, immature, procrastinator, sociopath? No conscience? Yeah. Didn't care? Something you did or didn't do, or you make more money than they did, or something like that, got into them, and they got you back with no conscience. Got it. I mean, we're not to worry about these people. 50% of what makes a sociopath, psychopath, con man, antisocial personality happens at conception. Okay? The other 50% has to do with nurture and yeah. how you raise them. So you can ra be raised like a Bernie Madoff. He right. kills you by taking your pension. Or it can be a Charlie Manson who takes your life. Yeah. So going back this marriage thing... I've, I've often heard that you marry the parent that wounded you the most. So mm -hmm. how do you feel about that? I'm not sure that it's an automatic kind of thing, but the problem is that we oftentimes don't identify. We don't, either we're, we're so used to being treated a certain way that we don't identify they're treating me the same way that I don't like. Yeah. Because it's so familiar. Yeah. Or we marry because it is familiar. Right. And we try Maybe to... not the right thing. It's just familiar. Oh, yeah. It's familiar. They feel like home, it even though home might have been a me. shit show. Yeah. See, I, I don't get... Because I've been around so many criminals and so many serious criminals, I don't ever get afraid of criminals. Yeah. We, we had a big thing, you and I, <laughs> in, in, a, in the neighborhood yeah. in which uh, they evacuated all the houses, and I got my chair and sat on my porch. Yeah. I wasn't leaving. Yeah. And, and then you and I helped solve, solve the problem. The problem. <laughs> <laughs> Remember? 
I was calling you and yeah. walking up to the front lines. Which, I mean, for phones. the listeners, one of the things about why we're doing this podcast is because in the last, from 2010 to 2020, about 10 to 12 percent of the buyers that we worked with or bought our properties were from out of state. Now, with COVID and how things have shifted from like a paradigm of how people want to live, it's over 50 percent. And one of the things I use that story as an example, a carjacker comes, ends up in a house across the street from your house that we happen to have listed, and we actually helped solve the yeah. crime, yeah. find them, which was interesting. But the one thing I say to people is like, when I was driving in my neighborhood, there were three helicopters and probably every squad car in Orange County. And I mean, you oh, name for this, it. This for, this, for a 22-year-old carjacker that- It was Irvine, it was Costa Mesa, it was Newport, and there were helicopters and drones and dogs and SWAT. And there was all this stuff for one 24-year-old kid. And because I had been involved in forensic psychology, I know this kid was not a shooter. Yeah. But it's interesting. That's a reason to move to Orange County. It's We're going to take care of crime. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other thing is interesting. I've got to talk to you about this after the filming. Is the gal right next door got robbed right after that. Really? And I want to know if the, there's cameras. Interesting, yeah. Common wall. Yeah, interesting. We'll talk about. Interesting. <laughs> so one of the reasons I asked that question is because I find myself, there's something to be said for like, as we have these questions that we're asking the wrong people, we're yeah. also attracted in relationships, friendships, marriages, whatever, to people that help address the issues that we never resolved as children. And I find myself in relationships with clients sometimes putting more efforts into the relationships that I know aren't the best, but it's just a natural thing because it's like I'm still working with that question, right? Yeah, yeah. And so it becomes complicated, but it's, it's almost as if we continue, you know, the, the, sta the statement, whatever you resist will only persist. Mm. Like until you address it, you're just going to be, have more invitations in relationships to address the issues that you have and take care of them. Otherwise, you're destined to repeat them, right? I don't think it's always a, kind of a negative thing. For right. instance, because I overcame my childhood issue and because I was able to figure out how to be a father and figure out how to be a husband, figure out how to be a man by watching and emulating other people I admired, I have a real sensitivity to people who are struggling. So homeless people, uh, people who are just so confused because of false conclusions. I have a real burden for them because I, I said, if I can do it, I can help you do it. Yeah. You know, so that's part of my attraction. And, and because, you know, uh, your issue with validation, maybe, in terms of the father issue, you might go out of your way for clients and help them because you want to be acknowledged or appreciated for the excellent work you do. Right. Yeah, for sure. So it's not like a negative thing, right. but it is the thing. Yeah. And you know where it comes from, and I know where mine's come from, but we, we do it in the service of others. Yeah, for sure. One of the things that I've really, like the last year, growing up the way that I did, I don't know that I was very good at having a voice in relationships and actually telling people what I needed or what I wanted. And so I've used a lot of strategies in my marriage that have not been effective, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And, and, and I'll give you an example. It's like, well, I need this, right? Which never comes across as good negotiation. And quoting, you know, Jared from our group, one of right. the things that he's so articulate about, he's like, well, why don't you do this? Why, if this is what you want, why don't you romance? Why don't you do this? And I'm like, oh my gosh, it's not just about me having the courage to say what I want. It's actually nurturing and loving another person to help them see so that they want to do it. Remember, that was a little girl you married, a little girl. She had a little, she was a little girl one time and you were a little boy. And we need to see these little kids. They have needs. Now we are very sensitive to our children and we know they have needs and we have sympathy and we give them a little space, okay? We don't give adults space, 
but those adults are little girls and little boys. And if you could understand that they may be confused or hurting or insecure and whatever, we can give them a little grace, give them a little pass, okay? Yeah, for sure. So in coming down here, I thought, if I were going to give some principles yes. to everybody listening yep. that I think would be, take it to the bank, it's 96,000 tries, and it works. Yes. Then maybe I could share that with you. I would love it. Okay. okay. But do we want to give the pearls before the swine? Are they ready for it? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> you just lost a lot of customers. I'm kidding. <laughs> okay. Somebody asked me, do you have a piece of advice you could give everybody? Yeah. In the world? Yeah. I said, sure. Yeah. Seek to understand more than try to be understood. You've heard me say that. Yes. Seek to understand more than try to be understood. That's a critical principle if you want to have a, 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 a growing relationship. And this I totally, idea of shut up and listen, wait till I finish, never works. Give me like a real example because I totally understand what you mean. Yeah. But practicing that is a little more difficult because in a relationship, most of the time we're seeking to understand just long enough so that we can throw what we want, interject in that. So give me a... Yeah, the first thing, you know, so you're talking, talking, and all of a sudden you hear something and bam, you're in the conversation. Right interjecting, interrupting, and all that stuff, defending and re-explaining. We, we, your, your father was explaining. You were saying, I feel this, and I thought I wasn't wanted, and all that. And he quickly interrupted. He didn't know that, and you didn't maybe pick it up. He quickly interrupted to explain. Which is our natural, that's the and That's our natural thing. Yeah. I'm, I'm seeking to understand and tell I feel like I'm either being misrepresented, you're being unfair, or I want you to understand. Right. You now want it's defend. all about you shut up and listen to me now. Yes, for sure. And we get that feeling. Oh, okay. But we feel some relief because we got a little more out than we did before. But wouldn't it be fair to say, like the thing that you say, if a baby throws up on you, has diarrhea, you can't take it personal? So part of the seeking to understand before understood is nothing's personal about what they're saying. Unless you make it personal, right? Well, you could shift from, you know, your father wants you to under, your father wants to understand what's going on. What, why have you felt? Why are you in therapy? Why do you want me to come? He's seeking to understand. And so you're giving him information. Yeah. If he interrupts and gets defensive or wants to explain, he's hit a soft spot, a vulnerable spot, and he wants you not to misunderstand, so he's interrupting you. You could shift back now to seeking to understand him. Right. And Which his is dynamics. what happened after because when we understood the embrace was, it was like, oh my gosh, we're totally just made our own conclusions to something that you didn't even mean. That IOD, IUD was not about you. No. It was about me. Yeah. I couldn't handle any more kids yeah. financially, emotionally, physically. I was... Uh, it had nothing to do with you. I didn't even have you in mind. Yeah. But you took it. Right. I made a my different own conclusions. Way. Yeah. You, you drove. You, you were not old enough to reach a conclusion, but you reached a conclusion, and it stayed in your life as confusion. But the point is, seek to understand. And then if they interject or interrupt or take away, then you shift seeking to understand what's Man, going on yeah. and try to find the dynamic that's going on. Because there's always time to explain, but you just want to listen and hear. And if you model understanding, hopefully they reciprocate. Yes, for but sure. shut up and listen to me. Let me finish. Yeah. Not finished. That never works and they'll reciprocate. So this is a real skill set that takes a lot of practice because in those moments when they strike a nerve, it's like, how do you just be like, this isn't about me. I'm understanding. Yep. And I'm, I'm doing going it. to understand. It. Yeah. Okay. That's number one. I love it. Yep. Number two. Uh, and you're really not interrupting me. You're interrupting yourself because you're not going to hear what I was going to say. Right. You just interrupted yourself, not me. Right. Instead of taking it personally, you interrupted me. You didn't let me finish. Yeah. But no, that's like. The, he couldn't take anymore. That's like the Four Agreements book I love where it's like nothing's personal. And what people say says more about them 
than it ever would about you. Yeah. You have to be really aware. I had, a, I had a t talk with that guy, and I, I took issue with some of the things he said. <laughs> okay, first point. Seek to understand more than be understood. Secondly, focus on understanding the needs of your partner and commit to meeting them. Understand the needs. Focus okay. on understanding the needs of your partner and commit to meeting well, them. Well, I was an expert for the first seven years of my marriage in hearing what she wanted and doing the things that she didn't want. Because now as I've, as I've gotten more aware, it's like, hey, if they're asking for something and it's reasonable, give it to them. Yeah. Right? And like, then you don't have to do the 90% of the other stuff that you're trying to do to solve their needs when they're telling you what their needs are. And so focus on the needs of your partner. Yep. And commit to meeting them. Commit to meeting don't them. Don't just know them. You got to commit to meeting them. Well, it's funny because this goes back to a story. I don't even know why it like... You know how sometimes you think you're so aware and you understand everything like that confidence thing? I went on a golf trip with one of my mentors, great guy, we're going to have him on the show. But when we're, when we're flying up, he's like telling this story about fill the tank. Fill the tank. He's like, you know what my relationship's great is because I spend the time like not just identifying the needs of my wife, but meeting those needs. And she'll let me, she lets me do all these things because I'm so focused. And so I came back with this whole thing like, fill the tank and the morning I came back I was actually in my wife's car and it was empty so I literally went and filled the tank so it's like this metaphor fill the tank yeah and then the second piece to it as I was filling the tank I look and there's a little sensor that says her tire pressure was empty on the back left side so don't just fill the tank fill the tires too right? be aware be, be aware. aware yeah be aware mm -hmm. which I've lacked I've, I've, and I've, that I lack awareness. I don't want to interrupt the confession. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that'll have more. There's something wrong with all of us. And, and by saying wrong, I mean blind spots, immaturities, you know, mistakes that we make. And I put the number at about 10%. Yeah. It could be 3%, but it's 10% or less. There's yeah. something wrong with everybody, including myself, right? Right. If we would focus on that percentage and make progress on that percentage, it would look like a hundred percent improvement to somebody else. Like an exponential. You fill difference. the tank and fill the tire, you right. get huge credit. Totally. For a half hour, twenty minute yeah. deal. Right. Yeah. It'll last forever. Yeah. Okay, so that's number two. What's number okay. three? Number three, support the relationship when it cannot support you. Ooh. Support the relationship when it's not supporting you. I'm guilty of this. We all are. These are all coming from because, my Because like there's life events. We lost my mother-in-law a year and a half ago. And it's like these are the times to support the relationship. When understanding, clear understanding, maybe it's not going to support you even yeah. though it has, right? Hey, I went to the funeral. I went... I, I, Put, I got the flowers. I got. I gave your. Don't you any credit? Yeah. Okay. Support the relationship when it's not able to support you. Right. Big one. Yeah. Uh, fourth. Understand how you contribute to every problem in the relationship. Understand. Ooh. Understand how you contribute in some way to every problem you're complaining about in the relationship. This is about being really honest with yourself. Catching yourself. Really honest, because there's so many things that we do to undermine our relationship that if we were really honest with ourselves, we know exactly what they are, but we do them anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So understanding your contribution in the challenges in a relationship. And it'll make, it'll, it'll make so much of a difference, much more difference, if you admit to what you believe your mistake is rather than be confronted with your mistake. Yeah, catch yourself. Catch yourself and then confess yourself. Yes. Remember? Yeah, for sure. Okay. And that does something to somebody too when you're like, whatever the challenge or the conflict you're in, when you can own 
your contribution, even if your contribution wasn't as big as theirs, but it's going to open it up where it's like, okay, for apologies or grace, it's the vulnerability, right? Yeah. Meet, meet them with vulnerability versus the alternative. So I was taking out the trash from my bathroom. I got distracted and I set it down in the living room. Yeah. Okay. Should have just go directly out the back door, but I got distracted. So then I kind of woke up in another part of the house and said, where's the trash? And I confronted my wife. I go, what'd you do with my trash? <laughs> Did you hide it somewhere? Where's the trash? Yeah. And she goes, I didn't know anything about the trash. I go, yes, you probably took it and you forgot. <laughs> I'm accusing her of all this stuff. Yeah. On these small little things, right? Yeah. And then she goes in the living room and says, is this the trash can or something? <laughs> I go, well, how did it get in there? And he goes, well, you brought it in. I went. And so I took the trash out. And while I'm taking the trash out, I'm thinking, you know, the right thing to do would be to apologize. Yeah. And there's two ways to apologize. I could say, uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. My bad. Yeah. Or I could say, I was wrong. And I was wrong is a much deeper apology than I'm sorry. Hey, sorry. Yeah. I was wrong. Yeah. And accusing you of that. Yeah. Owning it. Did you do that? Yeah, I did. Okay. <laughs> and I'm still talking about it. <laughs> okay. So understand how you contribute to every problem in your relationship. The fifth one is seek a second opinion sooner rather than later. Counseling, therapy, coaching, somebody you really trust, a mentor. Seek a second opinion. I'm going through this. I think this is my contribution. I don't know if I'm handling this right. This is what's going on. Help me find the, the thread, the dynamics. you got to be careful with that, though. In terms of who? Who you ask. Oh, yeah. Because one of the things that I've found is, like, there's a... And you're talking now not about confidentiality. You're talking about bad advice. Right. Because there's something about when people are telling their story more than once, they're usually not looking for an answer. They're looking for validation that they're right. Yeah. Right? And so it's really you have to be careful about who you are choosing yeah. to get advisement from, right? Right. So, But that's a huge thing. A second opinion of somebody that will actually give you good advice. Or advice that you may not like. Well, and we and and people are afraid they don't want to lose your friendship. Right. So if you ask a good friend, they may say, "Well, you know, I think you were right. I think you were right yeah. all along, and she was wrong." And you know, yeah, you gotta be careful. Uh, the sixth one is keep a sacred date night between you and your partner every week. Not whenever you can get it, but every week. And here's what will happen. And this is the way I do date night. And that is, and I think we've talked about it. There's four weeks in a month, generally. You take two, and your wife takes two. You plan the first one. She plans the second. You plan the third. She plans the fourth. You don't tell her where she's going to go. You only tell her what to wear. So if there's tickets or reservations or whatever, it doesn't have to be expensive. It could be a walk on the beach, but you don't want her walking in high heels. So you tell her what to wear, but not where you're going. And that way she knows, as busy as we all are, there's somebody planning a special night, a sacred night for the two of us. And that makes, makes a lot. And then next week's her turn. And it's not about, can you top this? Now, you need to keep the same for one month, you need to keep the same day or night or whatever it is. And here's what will happen. Things will come up. If you have a Thursday at 6 o'clock, things are going to come up Thursday at 6 o'clock that never came up before. Yeah, always. But what you do is you say to whoever it comes up for, we have a meeting, we have a this and that, go, I have a sacred date night with my wife. I can't make it. Can we reshuffle that, reschedule that? I'm sorry, I can't cancel this. It's only a date with your wife. You can cancel it, move it. Right. Well, then we get in the habit of moving it around until we don't do it anymore. The second thing that's going to happen is they're going to tell somebody. 
I told Tim we have a very important meeting. He told me he had a sacred date and I need good he had to cancel the meeting. Can you imagine that? <laughs> and then everybody's gonna say, particularly that guy's wife, he's going, Well, why aren't we doing it? Yeah. That is amazing. So you'll get the compliment for that. But keep a sacred date night. You're not to double date, you're not to talk about challenges or problems in your relationship, you're not to talk about taxes or the kids. You're just to go out and try to rekindle that time. When so it really takes some some communication and conversation. We're going to agree to this, and we're going to make it fun. It's not going to be a time where we sit and talk about the kids or yeah. money issues or other stuff. It's like we're going out there just to spend some time together. Have fun. And then you have to start exercising those muscles to have fun mm -hmm. with each other, which is like key. Or get some skills. Yeah. Go and get a therapist and get some skills and go to that date night with more skills. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> For sure. So is that all six? That's all six. So seeing as this, we're going to launch this in January, I kind of feel like this is right in the New Year's resolution. Yeah. Because it really is. And I think that there's these hooks mm -hmm. for all the listeners are unbelievable. Mm -hmm. So I thank you for being here. But before we end, I want to talk a little bit because this is about Orange County. Why Orange County? Why in all the places that you've lived... Why did you decide to settle down here? And you've been in the same house for 30 years. 30 years. Mm -hmm. So why why Newport Beach? I'm not a flipper. Yeah. 52 years of marriage <laughs> yeah. and 30 yeah. years in the house. Um, I find it a safe place. I find uh, people are highly educated. So there's the potential that we can love learning. And if we can turn that learning on in terms of internally, we can learn about ourselves. People who have that affinity towards education and improvement, maybe yeah. improve their own lives, not just their homes and their careers. Yeah. Improve their lives. Um, you know, people gave up on me very early in my life, and I don't give up on people, and I don't want people to give up on each other. So I have a kind of a commitment like that, and I see that... Uh, we can afford in Orange County to divorce financially, but we can't afford emotionally to flip our relationships and our marriages the way we do other things. And so I think that same capacity to learn and to be educated and to be well off, why don't we turn that inside and become more well off internally? Well, it's funny that you say that from a divorce standpoint, because you look at the divorce statistics, a first marriage, I believe it's around 50%. And then as you get second, third, fourth, the probability goes up. So really kind of what that tells me is no matter how bad issues are in a marriage, if you don't address them here, they're going to become in the next one and the next one. So why not just do the work now? Well, and what happens is you don't, you don't seem to, what you see, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of opposed to this 50 or 52% because nothing is the same every year since 1945, yeah, yeah, right. but too many. Uh, what happens is we don't acknowledge the part I played. I co-created an environment that we're now terminating. I co-created that. If I don't acknowledge the part and role I play in the marriage, I'm going to take that brokenness into the next relationship and it's not gonna last very long either. And that's what happens. Statistically, it says for every five years you're married, you need to take one year off in order to understand your part, what happened and things like that. So if you're married 25 years, that's five years. Yeah. Well, therapy can shorten that time it takes but you have to know what happened. If something cataclysmic like a breakup of a family or a breakup of a marriage, you gotta understand that. And typically we don't understand enough of it and we move on. Well, going back to me, so, you know, we've had challenges in our relationship and when it's become challenging, in the past I haven't always made the best decisions, right? Mm -hmm. And I've I mean, almost from a sabotage standpoint, you make it worse with your decisions. But now that I've changed, I'm changing, mm -hmm. and it's a constant change for growth, 
and I've changed kind of the metrics on my marriage, I've actually like look at my marriage and my partner and Amber as someone that's the best person for me that you could ever put on paper for me to become my best dad, best worker, best husband. And as I'm starting to realize your number two point, identify the needs mm -hmm. and meet those needs. Right. I'm getting a side of Amber that like is my dream girl, right? Who does she think she is to behave the way she does and treat you the way you she does sometimes in your life? Who does she think she is? The answer is my teacher. Right. She's teaching you things about your intolerance, your impatience, blind spot, and immaturity. Yeah. And you're better off for it if you embrace it rather than fight it. Right. Which is like, but but as I go through it, it's just amazing how time and therapy and just personal growth, like it just changes your perspective and your conclusions. And I'm like, by design of what's going on, it's like the perfect partnership for me. Right. And, and you've heard this said, that progress, personal growth, is one step back and two steps forward. Yeah. I don't believe that. Okay. I believe personal growth is three steps back and one step forward. Uh, okay. So would you say that you think people give up too easily? I think they don't understand when they give up. I don't think they understand giving up. I think they disguise it as something else. Yeah. But people do quit. Yeah. They quit on themselves. They quit on each other. Yeah. What's interesting about going through it, and maybe I'm talking too much, but it's like I realized the challenges that I brought to the marriage. They're challenging for her, but really what I'm doing is betraying myself. And I think like if you are true and honorable and honest to yourself, Number one, it allows you to be best for that other person. Yes, but I don't think you can betray yourself unless you know yourself. Ah. So what you're doing is you're acting out these immaturities. Right. Okay? Yeah. We're acting out until we properly catch ourselves and know what to do with what we understand or catch. Yeah. Before catching yourself, what am I going to do with it? Right, for sure. I'll just hate myself or criticize myself. That's not a good way. Well, that's you know, a... when you're two years old or maybe six months old, everything you find, you put in your mouth. Right. That's a way of processing. Right. Well, there's other ways that we process that are just as ineffective. Yeah. Today, we don't put it in our mouth. But where do we put it? When you catch yourself or you catch somebody else, where do you put it? Yeah. You don't put it in your mouth. Where do you put it in? Right. Maybe the subterranean pool of all this undigested life experience. Yeah. And then it comes cropping up and cropping up in another time. No, we have to learn how to process life. And we don't know how to process life. Well, so one of the things I want to say, I really appreciate our relationship. And I just have to go on camera to say, if you're not like, and I've been this way in every aspect of my life, business coaches, real estate coaches, if you're not finding a therapist and really being honest about personal growth, yeah you're really missing out. You're missing out on so many things that you just, people, it's, it's almost like, you know, the definition of sacrifice, if you look at the Latin word, it's to give up something, but to get something better. There is a, I mean, a utopia, if you're willing to really go and dig deep, and I know that this is a process, and this is my first decade in, but I have a lot more decades, so we gotta keep this going. So what if the life you're living is not the life that wants to live in you. You're finding that. You're questioning that. Is there more to my life? Right. Have I reached it? Have I, am I at the pinnacle? Yeah. Is there any more to uncover? Right. In one of the chapters I wrote, in one of the books, I wrote, knowing is really uncovering what we've known all along. Yeah, it's becoming aware of it, right? Becoming aware of what we've known all along. That's yeah. why when we, we go, aha, we have these deja vus. Yeah. It's because we've known it already. Right. But it's been clouded. Buried. So, so in ending, and we're going to do this quarterly, I can already tell, but in ending, if you're willing, oh. in ending, is there 
If you had a billboard or is there a quote or a motto that you live by that comes to mind? <laughs> Several come to mind, but nothing is so profound. Uh, a motto. Mm. Or a quote, or if you had to put something on a billboard, what would it say? That's a great question. You can get back to me on it. How about next quarter? Next quarter. <laughs> Any books that you would suggest? I was lecturing in China, and a guy came up to me and said, after hearing you talk, I think this is a book you need to have. I said, well, I'm going to be going through China. I can't be carrying books. <laughs> he says, my notes are in the margin." And I thought, that's a gift. Yeah. So I took the book. I took it back to the hotel, read it. It's one of my top five. Okay. Uh, and it's written here in America. It's called The Spirituality of Imperfection. I know it. You know that book. Yeah, I've read the it. The Spirituality of Imperfection. And tell me what it is that you love about the book. Because I've it's, read it multiple times. It's dense. Yeah. And you have to read the same page over twice or three times to get all the material in that. So I like dense books. because I like to meditate. I don't like just to read something like a car wash, car wash flyer. I, I want something dense. And uh, it talks about uh, we have to embrace our imperfections rather than deny them yeah. or reject them. We have to embrace our imperfections. It talks about the difference between spirituality and religion. If you can define it, it's religion. If you can't define it, it's spirituality. Religion is for those who are afraid of going to hell. Spirituality is for those who've been there. Yeah, I love that. Quote. And those kind of things. I mean, it's just a real honest book. Yeah. You well, know. well, thank you for being here today. Thank it was you. like a real treat. And thank you for everything you've done in my life to make it better. And tune in for next quarter. <laughs>